Hi, and welcome to a random Scottish history video, the like of which we've kind of seen before, but also not. The next is from the Inverness Courier for the 19th of March 1907, entitled Funeral and Death Rites of the Celts, the fourth lecture of the public course in survivals and belief in ritual among the Celts was delivered on Saturday by Reverend Dr. George Henderson in the Greek classroom of Glasgow University. It dealt with the funeral, ritual and rites pertaining to death and the dead. It was necessary at this stage, says Dr. Henderson, to bear in mind the noble words of Goethe, that only a part of what is important is useful in order to possess a thing completely, to have full mastery of it, one must study it for its own sake. An old rite of milk baptism and the simulating of the dead as living was touched upon. Discussing the ritual of the dead among the Celts, Dr. Henderson asked whether several theories of the soul might not be inferred from the various practices and old customs known to have existed. Reserving customs pointing to the Elysian theory of the soul, as well as such as might point to a possible sidereal theory for another occasion, he specified many rites which were explicable on the earthly theory. Some of these might not be Celtic in origin, yet the inconsistencies of folk belief were notorious, in no province more so than that in which the folk mind attained to the finding of the soul. The earthly theory was connected chiefly, but not exclusively perhaps, with interment. Old death dances and curious practices at like wakes were discussed. The lathaic, or coming back of the spirit, was instance, also fair claith, or churchyard sentry incumbent on the spirit of the last buried. The liturgy of lustration, the setting aside of water for the dead, was compared with similar customs in Greece and elsewhere. Beliefs connected with the shroud were spoken of. The Koranach, the Druidsi, the Koskes, the Highland Aug and the Briton Anku, the Sin Eater of Wales, the Highland custom of putting salt in the corpse, a rite widely diffused elsewhere. All these were practices which pointed to the lively belief that life was not extinguished with the mysterious corporeal change of death. A thought connection of the activity of folk spirit was here discernible. The dust of antique time lay thick around these rites. If some of these were explicable in the earthly theory of the soul, they included the continuance of life as a protracted duration. On one view of the water left apart for the dead, such continuance was at one time felt to be dependent on earthly support. There was likewise an inner content which in symbol pointed to the idea of continuous and active spirit. The virtues of the dead were transmissible to the survivors through sacraments. From the Fraserburgh Herald and Northern Counties Advertiser for 28th of July 1908, we have the Dead Bell, an old Scottish custom. In Scotland, the Dead Bell has served its day and generation, and being no longer regarded as an article of utility, it is now preserved in museums. In days when newspapers were much less numerous than now, intimation of death was made by means of funeral letters. In small towns, this means is still in use, a method which itself had antiquated the custom of giving notice by means of the dead bell. This was usually done by the beadle or church officer, who walked through the streets at a slow pace, stopping at intervals to ring a small bell termed the dead, passing or skelet bell. He then uncovered his head and, with an air of great solemnity, made the following intimation. Brethren and sisters, I hereby let ye to wit that her brother, or sister, name, address, and occupation, departed this life at, of the clock, according to the pleasure of the Almighty God, and you are all invited to attend the funeral on, at, of the clock. In her delightful personal recollections, Mary Somerville refers to various customs prevalent in Burntisland a century ago. Upon the death of any of the townspeople, she writes, a man went about ringing a bell at the doors of the friends and acquaintances of the person just dead, and after calling out, Oh ye, yeah, three times, he announced the death which had occurred. This was still called by the name of the passing bell, which in Catholic times invited the prayers of the living for the spirit just passed away. In some places, for example Jedburgh, the officer had to make the announcement at once, no matter how unseasonable the hour. 
Doubtless this method of intimating a death was somewhat primitive, but it served the modest wants of the period. When he had completed his round, it was customary for the bellman of Hoyk and other places to take the bell to the bereaved home and place it in the bed in which the corpse lay. This was in consequence of a gross superstition, and it was considered sacrilegious to take away the bell until the body was removed to the place of interment. In some places the services of the bell-ringer were again required on the occasion of the burial. He then lifted the bell from the death-bed and, walking in front of the bier, gave notice of the approach of the funeral procession by intermittent tinkles. Such was the custom in Jedburgh until about a century ago, and it also prevailed at Polworth, in Berwickshire, where the bell was rung in this manner in the belief that it would frighten away evil spirits. As the intimation made by means of the dead bell was understood to be a general invitation, funerals were largely attended. It is not now the custom in Scotland for women to attend funerals, but then it was not uncommon for female relatives to follow in the rear of the cortege, as far as the churchyard gate, where they usually halted and dispersed. When this time-honoured custom ceased in Kilmarnock, Kilmarnock 1639, was handed over to the charge of the town clerk. In Hoyk, the custom was in vogue until the early part of last century. The dead bell, which is preserved in the Archaeological Society's Museum, was made in Holland and bears in relief round the neck R.S.I.D. Hoyk, while round the rim are the words Ein Burgess Hivis Heft my Gigot Anno 1601. John Burgess House made me in the year 1601. The passing bell of the neighbouring town of Jedburgh is also preserved in the museum there, and bears an inscription to the effect that it was made by John Meikle of Edinburgh in 1694. It is somewhat damaged in consequence of having passed through a fire, which destroyed the old museum in 1898. Doubtless, there are numerous memorials of the obsolete custom in Scotland, but in many cases the bells would unfortunately be so little respected that when the custom lapsed, they would be regarded only as old metal. Which is a far cry from how they started out and how revered they were. Next, from the Aberdeen Press and Journal, for the 27th of January 1927, we have Funeral Customs. Study of Origin and Development The study of practices surrounding death and burial throughout the ages sounds a lugubrious occupation, as treated in a recently published volume, Funeral Customs, Their Origin and Development, the author of which is Mr. Bertram S. Puckle, it is one of singular interest and even, in certain aspects, fascination. It is a study that carries us back before the ages of writing and printing. Primitive graves in their contents throw valuable light on the manner in which our far-off ancestors buried their dead, and on their attitude to the greatest of all mysteries, death itself. It is also a study covering an immense variety of themes. Mr. Puckle, for example, who has consulted an amazing number of authorities, old and new, devotes chapters to the provisions of nature, death warnings, coffins, wakes, mourning bells, funeral feasts and processions, burial places, body snatching, state and public obsequies, cremation, embalming, epitaphs and mourning rings and cards. Has nature her undertaker? Certainly she has, in the person of the sexton beetle, which is dressed in a conventional garb of black and equipped with a highly serviceable spade. As Mr. Grant Allen reminds us in his fascinating Nature's Workshop, the beetle, or Necrophorus mortuorum, proceeds to excavate around a body till, by a process of gradual undermining, the dead animal sinks into a hollow thus prepared for its reception the work being completed by piling the earth neatly on the top. To quote Mr. Puckle, it teaches a lesson that burial is a natural method of disposing of the dead. In early days in Britain, the bodies of the poor were committed to the grave practically naked or at best wrapped in a shroud of linen, and only the prosperous were allowed to be chested, as it was called. In 1666, an act came into force making it compulsory for all persons to be buried in a shroud composed of woollen material in place of linen. This law, we learn, was designed to assist the paper trade. We are told that as a result of this law, it was computed that no less than £200,000 of rag were saved from corruption in the grave. In order to enforce the regulations, a heavy fine was imposed for non-compliance. 
but the gay decking of the corpse is a custom which dies hard, and persons of means were often found to pay the penalty rather than submit to what they consider an indignity. Many cases are on record where a coffin has been purchased during the lifetime of a person of eccentric habits and often served as a bed. It is well known that Madame Sarah Bernhard kept a coffin and was photographed in it in her boudoir. In Ireland, it was once a custom to remove the nails from a coffin before lowering it into the grave, in order that the dead might have no difficulty in freeing themselves on the day of resurrection. The origin of the practice of burying weapons and utensils with the dead is obviously the outcome of the belief that the departed spirit would require such material necessities in the afterlife. Referring to perpendicular burial common in the East, Mr. Puckle observes that it is not unknown in this country. Ben Johnson was buried in this manner in Westminster Abbey. The reason in this instance would seem to have been an economy of space. It was at one time supposed that the small stone covering his remains had led to this tradition. In order to settle the matter, a faculty was granted for the opening of the tomb when it was found that the body was upstanding as it had been supposed. The subject of cremation, as opposed to earth burial, has been a topic of discussion in our correspondence columns of late. Mr. Puckle remarks that a natural horror of fire is the first obstacle to be overcome if cremation is to become a general practice. He also points out that a strong argument against cremation is the incentive it affords to crime. The first cremation at Woking took place on March 26th, 1885, the body being that of a woman. Three years later, nearly a hundred bodies had been dealt with. The now abandoned custom of presenting mourning jewellery in memory of the dead was once a very general practice. In the Middle Ages and later, mourning rings were frequently mentioned in wills, a certain sum of money being set apart for the purchase and distribution of these mementos to the relations and friends of the family. In Shakespeare's will, for example, sums of money were mentioned for the purchase of rings for several of his friends, and Isaac Walton in 1683 willed rings as a friend's farewell, the cost of which he specified as 13 shillings, 4 pence each. Here we have some examples of mourning jewellery, as depicted within this article from the original Aberdeen Press and Journal page. Those who essay to break down conventions sometimes meet with unexpected opposition. The scene of the following incident was a house in one of the best parts of a well-known London suburb. A death had taken place in the family and it had fallen to the lot of the eldest daughter to make the arrangements for the funeral. She asked for a plain elm coffin without any ornaments. Elm, said the horrified undertaker. But you can't have anything but polished oak in a road like this. A somewhat gruesome chapter deals with body snatching, which is accompanied by a picture of the two notorious resurrection men, Burke and Hare. Reference is also made in this chapter to the celebrated case involving the theft of the body of the 25th Earl of Crawford from the family vault at Donecht, a mystery that has never been completely solved. The First Crematorium opened in Glasgow, was over at uh, the Western Necropolis, over Mary Hill Way, in 1895. People who had been cremated prior to this point were likely to have been so post-strangulation as witches and warlocks, prior to being burnt at the stake and thereby cremated old school. From the Scotsman, for the 29th of May 1931, we have Forfer Langstrang Bell. Since 1657, it has been the custom to toll a funeral knell on the famous Forfer Bell Langstrang at the burial of a member of the Strang family. Yesterday, that custom was observed for what will, in all probability, be the last time. The funeral was that of Jessie Strang, aged 87, widow of George Scott Mason. Mrs. Scott was the last member of the Strang family left in Forfer. 
The bells were gifted to the town in 1657 by the brothers Strang, who had built up a flourishing business in Stockholm, from where the bells were shipped to Forfar via Dundee. According to tradition, the Dundee people extracted the tongue of the large bell and threw it in the tay, and further demanded that Forfar should buy the foreshore over which the bell would have to have been conveyed. It is reputed that it was from this that the thoroughfares in Forfar and Dundee were named the Forfar Loan and the Dundee Loan. The bells were eventually placed in the Tower of Forfar Parish Church, where they do duty to this day. From the Gazette, the 21st of July 1939, we have Peeps into the Past, Old Funeral Customs. In the 18th century, it was a dangerous thing to be ill, an expensive thing to die, and sometimes ruinous to be buried for the cost of a funeral might be as much as a year's income. It was once remarked by an English officer that a Scottish funeral was merrier than an English wedding. Feasting was usually lavish and prolonged, and indulgence in drinking was common. It is recorded of a man on returning from some function that he was not sure whether it was a marriage or a funeral he had attended, but he enjoyed it in any case. The success of a funeral used to be measured by the amount of drink consumed, and one Highland gentleman used to boast that his mother's funeral had been the finest in the parish. Judged by the liquor consumption, refreshments, cheese, bread and drink were served before starting, and at every halt in the journey. If a beer had to be carried a long way by relays of men, sometimes a cairn was set up at a halting place after a service of refreshments. Many strange stories are told about olden funerals. At the funeral of the mother of Lord President Forbes of Culloden, the party arrived at the grave to find that the corpse had been left behind. At one time, it is to be feared, funerals were orgies of drinking, and Neil Monroe tells somewhere of a coffin which had been left at a public house door, where the procession had halted, and which was not missed till the cemetery was reached. It is not recorded whether on this occasion the mourners were accompanied by a minister, but in any case there is no suspicion of tippling being common outside the humble people. Ministers might have their lapses, but not at interments, and though demissions and depositions were frequent among them at one period, it cannot be said that their conduct at funerals ever conducted to these results. At one time ministers would attend only the obsequies of their own flock, but in most cases a less rigid rule is now observed. In the Highlands, funerals without ministers were once common, but later their services were seldom dispensed with. It is rather strange that, though religion entered intimately into almost every event in human life, there was one occasion when it was strikingly absent, v. at funerals. The old savour of popery still hung suspiciously round death or burial, and there was a dread lest any religious act should countenance the superstitions of the past, so funerals and burials were treated as purely civil acts, and no religious service was permitted. Religious services at burials never found favour in the church. They were discouraged both by Knox's first book of discipline and the Westminster Directory. The Westminster Assembly maintained that the burial of the dead was not part of the work of the minister like baptism and marriage, but when a minister was present he might give words of exhortation to Christian friends attending. If the minister was present he had no professional part and his presence was not essential, though after 1700 it was usual. The only recognition of religion was in the long and copious graces and thanks returned for the refreshments. The bread, cheese and liquors were preceded by a grace and followed by a thanksgiving, so it was by way of sanctifying the feast and not of solemnising the burial that prayer was heard at a funeral. These long graces were said by any sedate person, such as an elder or the minister, if present. Gradually the presence of the minister became a matter of course, and the prayers became more elaborate. When funeral repasts disappeared, the devotional exercises, which were originally graces over food, became the service over the dead before the body was removed. From the moment of death till the departure of the funeral procession, the corpse was watched night and day by parties of friends and neighbours. Silence was observed, but frequent refreshments were received. Where such like wakes were observed, it was sometimes sarcastically remarked that the friends of the departed watched the dead body to keep evil spirits away, and frequently carused to keep their own spirits up. 
there was usually a lavish feast on the evening preceding the funeral at which the minister pronounced a lengthy blessing friends came from far and near to pay their last respects to the memory of the departed and their last attentions to his cellar the bellman used to perambulate the streets announcing the name and address of the deceased with the tinkle of the dead bell and inviting all to be present at the interment if any one were absent it was considered discourtesy to the dead an insult to the living and a gross neglect of christian duty a funeral was a great occasion for the poor and vagrants professional beggars used to swarm to both marriages and funerals after the guests had partaken of the refreshments before lifting the poor participated in the food left old household accounts show that their share in post-mortem charity was considerable the expenses for mourning food and drink rose to vast sums the custom of ringing the bell at funerals was common in scotland before the reformation and continued afterwards as a procession passed on the kirk bell hanging from a tree was jerked in fitful tolling by the beadle it may be that this custom like the ringing of church bells originated in the superstition that the sound of bells scared away evil spirits the charge for tolling the church bell usually went to the fund for the poor but in 1730, a court case decided that the fees for the ringing of bells at funerals did not properly belong to the fund for poor relief, but might be used for the maintenance of the church fabric. In the procession, the beadle went in front tinkling the dead bell. After the interment, the friends returned to the house to partake of a second repast, called the Dredgy, Old Catholic Dirige. When death occurred in a family of high standing, the doors of the church in which the deceased worshipped were painted black. This happened at Shotskirk at the death of the Laird of Murdiston. It was always the ambition of even the poorest in Scotland to have what was called a decent funeral. In preparation for this, it was the tradition that whenever a woman married, she began to spin her winding sheet, which was kept reverently till required for her burial. All the male inhabitants of the parish were invited to a funeral, and the usual entertainment given. Now the expenses for coffin, ale, cake, and tobacco amounted to a considerable sum, and this sum everybody was anxious to save up to provide for the event of death. Of course, convivial obsequies were out of the question for one on the poor roll. Before the use of coffins became general, the General Assembly in 1563 ordered every parish to have a beer to carry the corpse of the poor to the burial place. These beers were of different kinds, some mere rails covered by a mart cloth or pall, others a wooden box with a lid on one side, furnished with hinges so that the corpse could be taken out and lowered into the grave. In some parts of the highlands, a long basket made of twisted rushes with loops for the carrying handles was in use, known as the death hamper. Palls were from an early period regarded as an essential part of funeral paraphernalia. Frequent references occur in Kirk Session records of expenses for new mort cloths and for the provision of coffins for the interment of paupers, also for winding sheets without coffins, from which we may infer that the funeral outlay on the poor was sometimes restricted to a winding sheet. At a pauper's funeral, the body was carried to the grave in the parish coffin, and ill-made, kissed, without the dignity of a mort cloth to cover it. The bottom of this public kiss was hinged so as to allow the body to be dropped into the grave, but sometimes a sympathetic kirk session, not to disappoint a poor soul of a festive funeral, supplied the necessary money. It was a common practice long ago to bury unbaptized children apart from other people. The north side of the churchyard was reserved for this purpose. This was a relic of popery and against Protestant principles. Suicides and excommunicated people were also buried apart generally under cloud of night. Today the burial of the dead is carried out with decorum and propriety. It seldom happens that there is any occasion for clerical rebuke, for where refreshments are not entirely dispensed with, they are supplied only in strict moderation. In that article, it mentions how religion was absent from funerals. And it was something I'd always been curious about since typing up and translating uh, Balfour's historical works. So we had people of note. You had lords and ladies and earls and, and people of varying high classes of 
archaic caste system within Scotland. Being buried without ceremony, and I had always wondered what they meant by that. Were they literally just dumped in the ground and discarded and the people moved on with their lives? But I think what was meant by it was that after the Reformation, the Protestants and Presbyterians of Scotland, and elsewhere in Britain, I guess, where Catholicism was really put down in the mid-16th century, after that they were so reticent to have any symbolism of the old Catholic ways, what was now considered superstitions to be part of their lives. And you would find that even marriages became a more simple affair. The The reason for the Reformation, or part of the reason for the Reformation, was the people's need to remove ostentatiousness from the churches. So I think what was meant by buried without ceremony was to be buried without religion. Not that the body was discarded, but that it was devoid of religion or religious overtones, that it hadn't the pomp and circumstance of funerals of an earlier age, a Catholic age, to the start of the 16th century uh, and previous to then. I think that's what was meant. And that did have me curious until this article. Not curious enough to obviously find out prior to now, but it's nice that he he made mention of that. Also, he mentions something we talked about in an Independence Live mini-doc video, and that's the new wife taking to creating her grave clothes, her winding sheet, almost from the get-go. Now, she wouldn't just make it for herself. She would make it for the family. She would make her husband one. When she had children, she would make them their winding sheets. They would be brought out on an annual basis for an airing. They were treated very reverentially. And that if a man, husband, was to take his wife's winding sheets to pawn them for any reason. He was denounced as the worst of men. That that was robbery to the worst extent, that it was so disrespectful. He also mentions that in the Highlands, a long basket was used as a coffin made of winding rushes or twisted rushes, it says. And both my good friend Harry Hamilton, who I make mention of in the About video for Random Scottish History, he was buried in a woven casket as was his sister uh, not so long ago, just a couple of years ago, Anna Morid Hamilton. She was also buried in a a woven casket, and uh, I didn't get to go to Harry's funeral, but Anna Morid's was absolutely beautiful, and it definitely suited her. And the last article that we have is from the Brechin Advertiser for the 20th of August 1956, entitled Habits of the Citizens a Century Ago, Death Rites and Superstitions. The last hundred years have brought many changes and improvements to our everyday lives. Customs and ceremonies, often of a superstitious origin, prevalent a century ago, have disappeared or linger only in a much modified form. It may be interesting to recall some of the old practices and beliefs of our forefathers, some of them peculiar to this district, but many appearing in slightly varying forms over a wide area, especially as they relate to what remain the three great landmarks in a person's life, 
birth, marriage and death, death omens and funeral customs. Many curious superstitions were connected in our forefathers' minds with the presence of death. The deed trap, candle spells, or the moaning of a dog in the middle of the night were looked upon as an infallible sign of its approach, while after the death had taken place it was accustomed to stop the clock and cover it, and the mirror, with a snow-white cloth. Cats and dogs were excluded from the house until after the funeral in the belief that if either happened to leap over the corpse and afterwards be permitted to live, the devil would gain power over the dead person. A small plateful of salt was sometimes placed in the breast of the corpse to prevent the devil from disturbing the body. The origin of the light wakes so common a hundred years ago was a fear that if the body was not watched the devil would carry it off. As funeral letters were only in use to a very limited extent at the beginning of last century, the common method of inviting to a funeral in Brechin at that date was to send round a deputation consisting of the writer, undertaker and a private friend, both dressed in black, with a written document containing the compliments of the nearest relative and a list of the persons to be invited. The undertaker usually delivered this message. A great many of the funerals took place on Sunday as the most convenient day for mourners to attend. For weekday funerals, people went just in their working clothes, often wearing their aprons and nightcaps, and with no outward sign of respect for the deceased. So I was unable to find an article relating to an interesting word that I'd come across in my researches. Disaloof which the Dictionary of the Scots Language defines as a former practice in blessing a corpse of the attendants putting their hands in the three empty dishes placed on the hearth near the body and repeating the rhyme of saining, beginning thus, thrice the torchy, thrice the salty, thrice the dishes tum for loffy, adding, The company of attendants then walk out of the room where the body is laid, either to the door or into another room, and instantly return to the apartment where the corpse is, backwards, and place their hands in the dishes and repeat a rhyme of saining. This was called disaloof. So there we go. We'll finish by having a short show and tell of the items available to view within the random Scottish history space at present. We've shown them throughout the video, glances of them, and we'll have a wee talk about what each thing is. These items, for the most part, are here courtesy of a very good friend of mine who is in Italy and is as much of a fan of these things as I am, I suspect. So we'll get into these things just now, shall we? Okay, we're going to get into some show and tell items. So we have this, and this was the first item that I obtained. It's made of hair, as you can see, with gold fittings. It's a pocket watch fob, as you can tell by this bit. And it was sent over from Ireland, where we feel that it's this young lady's hair it's made of. And it was likely her husband that made this possible as a creation uh, on her demise in order to keep her nearby and Uh, Keep her with him in some sense. And it's beautiful. And we've already shown you that Yvette wears it. So this is our first item. In the show and tell. And it was my first item. Obtained for the RSH collection. Next we have this. It's another pocket watch fob. Again, you can tell by this bit. Now, this is a little more glamorous, so it's possible that a female bought this um, to mourn a deceased lover, perhaps, a deceased male family member in her life. 
So I don't believe this is made of hair because when something was made from hair they wanted to uh, braid it up beautifully. We've got some excellent examples to show you and so it would be shown off and I think it was a way of their saying look I've gone as far as to pay this respect to the person that I've lost. So I believe this is fabric and beads um, that just make up this. This could be treated hair. It doesn't feel like the other hair made items that we have. It could be. Um, but this skull is made from a tooth. It's carved out of maybe a, a molar. And this could be the tooth of the family member that was lost uh, by whoever had this made. And this was the second item that I obtained. Because I think he's cute. Look at that face. Okay. Now we're going to get into some examples uh, that I've purchased on behalf of a friend. So this is another pocket watch. You can tell by this part. This is black glass, I think, from the feeling of it. It uh, seems like black glass or obsidian, maybe. Uh, I don't know that it's heavy enough to be obsidian, but maybe. And it's got this nice braided gold fixture. And then it's uh, another nice example, similar to the first. Less frayed, perhaps, than the first. Better taken care of. You can see all the work that's gone into braiding this hair. So again, likely a gentleman that's bought this and had this made for himself from the hair of a female, again, lover or relative that he's lost. And the hair is a really nice, even colour. Um, I think they've done a beautiful job of this one. You can see all the layers within it, where it's been woven. You can see the depth within it. I like these textures. And we also have something not made from human anythings. This is a brooch, a morning brooch with forget-me-nots on it. And it's almost like a barrette. Um, it's a beautiful style. Really gorgeous. Lots of really nice wee details in it. We have another brooch. Now this in the middle is hair. I hope you can see the braiding of the hair within the centre of this. And again, this is a morning brooch. And um, perhaps uh, we're stereotyping, but this is likely to be a female um, a custom made item for a, a woman. Male's hair tended to be shorter, obviously. So with what little they could get a hold of, it would be easy enough to make a brooch centre, to weave a nice brooch centre rather than a long pocket watch chain as you could out of the hair of a, a departed wife. But again, the details in this are just absolutely gorgeous. The edging and it's just absolutely beautiful. We have another brooch and this is like ferns or a fleur-de-lis kind of style made out of hair. You've got seed pearls, you've got gold fittings here just to add decor. Very nice fine details 
it's once again beautiful. This was far chunkier than I expected when it came through and I actually started looking to see if perhaps there were hinges anywhere that perhaps it would open and uh, maybe there would be a space for a photo or something within it but no it has a different secret this one so let's unclip this and you see on the back here this is also braided hair don't know again whether you can see the grain of that under this light but it's also braided hair and now what this one does is it swivels to allow for the more morning side, the plain dark of the hair to show through so you can be in even deeper mourning than when you had the decorative hair decal on the front. It's always nice to have options. So again I would suggest this was made by a female in remembrance of perhaps a, a husband or child. This hair is very delicate which is what makes me think child but there's obviously enough to weave into the back to create this extra portion here, this extra dimension to this brooch. We have a bracelet and I like this because the hair tended to be brown, varying shades of brown and I like that this was more grey blonde but you can see the black streaks the random dark hairs that are still within it. Once again you can see all the detail, the extra dimensions of the pattern the weaving has created. And these are maybe just silver fixtures here. So with a very little wrist for this one. This one is another pocket watch, far daintier than those that have come before. Again there's a the potential that this one was made for a female in how very delicate it is and these heart fixtures but it could have just been a a heartsick gentleman who had lost a, a love of his life and wanted something very special to remember her by. It's very finely braided, it's far tinier um, pattern and weave than the, the others previously. You have these beautiful gold fi fixtures throughout. Once again, you've got another heart in the end here. So this is the one that I'm wearing wrapped twice around my wrist through the video because it makes for a really nice wee bracelet. Um, I was wearing the morning ring too throughout the video um, because I am a fan of this morning ring. I couldn't tell you if maybe it's waxed hair in the inside or some other kind of material. Um, it's very hard to tell, but I like the wee delicate gold chains in it. And again, the lovely wee gold fittings that just hold it together quite nicely. Um, I'm a big fan of the morning ring and we discuss morning rings near the start of the video. And finally we have another pocket watch and pocket watches I find to be super covetable just because of how much effort has gone into them, the extent of hair that comprises them 
and this one has a variation of weaving styles throughout it and look how beautiful this is it's so smooth so beautiful again the texture is just you can see the depth within it and they obviously took very good care to to make these to a high standard knowing that this was literally the last remnant sometimes that the bereaved had of those that they'd lost. How absolutely gorgeous that is. I wonder how long these things would have taken someone to make. And again, this one is more of a blonde colour, a honey colour rather than the, the browns that have come before. So that is our morning jewellery for uh, this video and this show and tell and I want to give a really huge thank you to my Italian friend um, for letting me show off some of her items before I send them over and she can get her hands on them. She'll have been impatiently waiting <laughs> every day that it's taken me to to do this video so thank you so much and you know who you are i'll not uh, out you um being a rather private person but yeah thank you so much for letting me show off all these beautiful wee trinkets and mourning piece of mourning jewelry from the 19th century every one of these is a uh, a 19th century offering. All of these beautiful brooches. I haven't acquired any brooches for myself, but I'm definitely tempted <laughs> after seeing what can be discovered. So this is our wee collection of antiques for show and tell, or morning jewellery, and I hope you enjoyed it. I'll hand you back over to the other Jenny. Well thank you so much for joining me for this randomly decided upon video on death and funeral customs in Scottish history. I very much appreciate your company for this one and you can do the things that other YouTubers insist upon like subscribing if you feel like you want to see more content for myself and uh, more of what we do. By all means have a wee look and see what's already been uploaded because there's a lot of random Scottish history out there already. Uh, I can't recommend the books that I mentioned at the start of the video enough. Uh, the Square Mile Murders just makes for an absolutely fascinating read and is a contemporary relation of the varying murders that took place between 1857 and 1908 in the just to the west end of Glasgow city centre. Um, the Railway Incidents is also a fascinating look into the railways prior to any health and safety regulations. Uh, but there are also heartwarming and heroic tales, funny stories to bizarre, weird occurrences, as well as your more morbid events that took place on Scotland's railways. Uh, all of our publications can be found um, by searching either my name or Random Scottish History in Amazon. You'll find them there. And until the next one, stay well and healthy. Look after yourselves and each other. And I will see you in the next one. Take care.
mother of a family, Hadid, the father, was not a teetotaler. Hadid had died. Hadid. <laughs> Sorry. 